اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین شفیع ذنوبنا وطبیب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا ابي القاسم محمد واله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واصحابه المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اعظم الله اجورنا واجوركم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم we have to look at history and try and understand as to what happened from the time of the prophet and 50 years after the prophet that somebody like yazid ascended to the place of khilafa that was given through the prophet and created in the name of god how could things have deteriorated so much within a span of 50 years that the muslims actually found this event an acceptable event of course and afterwards it was propagated and people revolted against yazid and that was the whole caliber of the sacrifice of husain ibn ali salamullah alayhi and the work of lady zainab salamullah alayha but we have to think what happened please salawat yes <laughs> we have to try and understand well what went wrong in those 50 years and what was the prophet trying to do that within 50 years it was so undermined when we look at the prophets within the quran we find that they are all social reformers apart from khidr maybe salamullah alayhi or nabi yahya who lived solitary lives or in solitude the rest of them were busy in reforming the community and they found that their success was in the reformation of the community at large we find when we read the quran after adam the prophets who came they were according to worldly terms not very successful majority of the people in their communities were being destroyed as time went on we find that more people received salvation and lesser number of people were condemned to death and destruction but the point i'm trying to make here is that the majority of the prophets were all social reformers they understood somehow through their missionary role that salvation of humanity guarantees their own salvation and that it was something that they were duty bound to do So we are seeing this that the prophets could have easily taken to the caves they could have easily been content with worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but no they took on the arduous task of reforming the people and in that process they suffered and the poor people were destroyed as well this brings to mind the khutbah of Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam known as shakshakiya in which he said that i would have casted the reins of authority back upon its own self he said it in this way i would have casted the reins of authority upon the back of the camel and let it be had it not been for a covenant taken by god that those who are endowed with knowledge establish social justice take from the oppressed oppressive and give it to the oppressed and restore that balance he says he is duty bound it's a covenant with allah 
And we find the prophets before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. all acting in accordance with some form of a pact that they have made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which tirelessly they are seeking the reformation of their community. It is as if the prophets know that their own salvation relies upon the salvation of the community. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks so harshly with these prophets. What did they respond to you after you left? They said, we don't know. The Quran says the prophets are saying, we don't know. You know best what they did after we left. Isa, did you do this and this? Did you say, said, I bore witness upon my community for as long as I was with them. After I left, you know best what they did, O oh God. So every prophet came, every prophet did his best to try and bring about reform within the community. When the prophet came, he did two things. He understood well that the reformation of the human community is the purpose on the face of this earth. In accordance with the whole of this understanding that we have that Allah made his Khalifa upon the earth and that was the purpose of man, to be a Khalifa of Allah. And a Khalifa of Allah cannot be murderous, brutal, barbarian. Khalifa of Allah has to be an angelic person. Has to be a person who does good to others. Has to be a person who comes out as a beautiful human soul. Yes, from the cradle of animality into the falls of humanity and ascending to the angelic realms. That is the Khalifa of Allah. So that was the purpose meant for us on the face of this earth. So the Prophet of Allah, what he did was, he made us mindful of two things. One was that our, that spiritual belonging that we have to Allah. And the other was regulated us in our physical lives. He showed us two things. That inwardly, we need to turn to Allah. Allah has to become the goal and the focus of our existence. We need to become spiritual people. People who are yearning God and becoming godly and godlike through the passage of time, not individually, but as a community. On the other hand, he showed us how to make that easy within a bodily context by bringing about social justice. A society in which there is fair play, the situation is conducive for growth, where there are rights given properly, where people are behaving righteously towards each other. They know their boundaries. In fact, in the time of the Prophet, the situation was this, that the people were so spiritually endowed that they would go to the Prophet and they would confess about their sins. And they would say, Ya Rasulullah, if you are to punish us now, it is better for us than to incur the displeasure of Allah in the hereafter. This is how spiritual he made them. And about them, Imam Ali Salamullah Najir Balagha says, where are the likes of the Sahaba of Muhammad Rasulullah amongst you? Where are the foreheads bearing signs of lengthy prostrations to Allah? Where are the dried lips that are indicative of the constant tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where are the shrunk stomachs revealing hunger in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where do I, why do I not see the example of the Sahaba of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amongst you? So the Prophet did two things. He turned the community inwardly towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, endowed them spiritually. Allah is your focus, Allah is your goal. You are noble creatures. And at the level of society, he gave a system and he said, this is a just system. Follow this system and improve it as you go along. And the Prophet actually physically showed that whenever new forms of governance used to come, he used to actually welcome them. He used to open his arms and say, well, this is a good idea, it's not a bad idea. Maybe we should employ this. What happened was that after the Prophet went, we did not have somebody like the Prophet ascending to the seat of Khilafah. What happened was 
that that spiritual component and element was compromised. Islam was never about expanding. It was never about that. Islam was about providing, sorry, bringing about a righteous, godly community through their consent. Not making Muslims out of people and conquering land. This was a part of the world. This was a worldly play. The Prophet understood it very differently. Think about it carefully. How many battles did the Prophet fight in order to gain land? How many battles did the Prophet initiate to spread Islam? You will find it very difficult to find one. In how many battles did the Prophet coerce people to become Muslims? In that case, he was against his own Quran if he did that like Raha fid Deen. Look at how peacefully he chose to live. Lakum dinukum waliyadeen. But this is not being said to the people of the book. This is being said to the people who are considered as enemies of God at that point. Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun. Say, O oh, you who disbelieve. And even then the Quran addresses them with utmost respect. Ya ayyuha. O oh, you who are disbelievers because there was a group that associated themselves as a disbelievers or oh, you who disbelieve you have your religion I have mine as far as the people of the book were concerned what did he say Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawain bainana wa bainakum. say to the people of the book come to that which is common between us and between you that we shall not worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will not associate with Allah anybody he was bringing about a spiritual righteous moral community to the consent of the people if you don't have consenting hearts you can never bring about a spiritual community you can never bring about a morally righteous community you can bring about dictatorship democracy monarchy but you can bring about even i will say this a theocracy but you can't become bring about a spiritual and a moral community it is only when the hearts have this understanding that there is a loftier purpose of existence. So the Prophet was never about expanding. After the Prophet, he was not replaced by somebody who understood this like the Prophet understood it. It is very easy to say that Khalifa Abu Bakr was not the best person for that role. It is easy to say. But the real damage done was by Khalifa Umar when he did not rule because Khalifa Abu Bakr's reign was very short. I have nothing to do with Khilaf or anything else. They are first, second, third Khalifs of Islam. I'm, I'm not taking a dig at anybody. I'm just explaining. Because as human beings, we need to be objective. Islam, the Abrahamic faiths, the non-Abrahamic faiths, the human race is my family, is my concern. Yes? That's why I need to have this freedom to try and understand things. The real damage was done, I suppose, within Islam at the time of Khalifa Umar. When there was great expansion of Islam. But this spiritual message was not carried forward. This fairness, equality, equity, righteousness, a balanced state of world and hereafter was not conveyed. This sense of value of the other, morality, was not being enforced. You see, the Quran says that seek goodness of others. It says, ask of your neighbors. And the person who accompanies you on the travel, be good to them. And people have counted that according to the verse of the Quran, we are supposed to ask 40 neighbors on each side as to how they are. The first Imam says, we were afraid that Allah's Prophet would include them in inheritance. The Quran says, فَأَمَّ الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَمَسَائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ Don't abandon the orphan, do not chase away the poor. So in the prophetic society, there wasn't supposed to be an orphan that is not being taken care of. 
There wasn't supposed to be a poor man, a hungry man. After the Prophet of Islam, this message was never carried forward. And it couldn't be carried forward. Because they were not people who were equipped to head a spiritual community. They did a phenomenal job at heading the Ummah minus God and spirituality. And Ummah minus deep-seated spiritual morality, they were pre perfect for that. Beautiful expansion of Islam, gaining of land, what not, whatever else. But they were not people who were people who could bring forward the prophetic sentiment, the divine message of the Quran. So what happened was that, I'm talking about the immediate cause, Khalifa Umar never put Muawiyah under check. And then he made a big blunder. It's honest, he made a huge blunder by not appointing as a Khalifa the first Imam and left it within that community. And Khalifa Osman came and of course with his nepotism was the last nail in the coffin of spiritual Islam. Now I respect all these people to the utmost degree, yes? But when we look at things, we have to be very honest. So what suffered this, the thing that went wrong was not having a righteous leadership. But that righteous leadership is not somebody who is qualified in Islam. Right? This is the mistake we are making. This is the mistake we are making. Righteous leadership is that leadership that is, has insight from Allah. That knows that deep-seated sense of spirituality. Understands human morality and then can formulate the rest of their policies around these facets and tenets. Social justice in light of moral spirituality. Organization of the people in light of spirituality. Tell me, the people who butchered Imam Hussein Salamullah were praying namaz, weren't they? The one who assassinated Imam Ali did so in the state of fast and he was a Qari of the Quran. Are you seeing this? This was the mistake they made. For them it has to be a Muslim. Praying, fasting, whatever. Yazid of course was questionable whether he was praying and fasting in the first instance, yes? It was questionable whether he But I know people who don't pray, who don't fast, yes? But who are righteous people. Who drink alcohol and yet they govern the world in a spiritual and a moral fashion. So we're beginning to understand that all these prayers and fast and things like that are just forms. We're just forms to regulate human beings and human beings' spirituality with God. But the central tenet was God himself. <coughs> was being invested with that vision of hereafter and growth. Was that whole understanding that the community is my bigger body, is my bigger family. They are no different to me. I'm not looking after my sons and daughters, but these 40 neighbors are my family. That was the message that was forgotten totally. And that is what leads to Karbala. And you find, I find it amazing. 50 years only, the Prophet said, this young boy is the Lord of the youth of paradise. He's put to death. In 50 years, and people remember this statement of the Prophet. They remember this statement, and yet he's put to death without any sin. So what went wrong was that spiritual component was not there. And that spiritual component can only be understood by somebody endowed with that light of God. You see, when Lady Fatima was lamenting at Ohad, Salawat. And they said to her, they said, you lament so bitterly for your fadak. And she said, no, I don't have any concern with fadak. It's for the right of my husband. Had his right been given to him, Muslims would not have been indifferent about Islam. Her concern was a very broad concern. You cannot narrow it down to things like fadak. I want leadership because my husband's leadership. No, for her, her husband is not... Her husband, her husband represents the continuation of the divine leadership with which the Prophet came. That's what her husband means to be Fatima. It's not 
anything to do with nepotism or my family and nothing to do with that. These people didn't understand this Sayyid and non-Sayyid business like the way we understand it. This is very wrong the way we understand things. They were pure souls. They were pure people. Yes. So things that went wrong was that Islam lost its spirit. Islam retained its form. You see, a godly person would understand that does Allah need two billion people doing sajda to him without understanding who he is? When Allah is giving paradise to the Jews and the Christians in the Quran, look at the Quran, read the Quran, by the way. I always tell my audience, for the sake of Allah, he has spoken to us in that book. Read it. And then, if the apparent verses of the Quran appear to be too generous for you, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is way too generous giving paradise to the Christians and the Jews, and Allah should not be doing this, this is what the Muslims feel, right? That Prophet Allah should not be giving paradise to other than me. Then read the exegesy. See what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself has said about these verses. See what the Imams, the children of the Prophet, have said about these verses. Yes? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving paradise, to the people of the book and outside the people of the book, if you read the Quran, Surah Baqarah accurately and others, when the Jews used to say, ma'aduda," The fire will not touch us, say for a few days. Say, have you taken an oath with Allah? Have you taken a compact, uh, sorry, a covenant with God? Bala. Allah is saying, Bala, yes. Man aslama wajhu lillah. The one who submit, gives his all to Allah. Wa huwa muhsin. And he does righteous deeds. Allah will give him Jannah. End of story. He's not even mentioning the Prophet or hereafter or anything. And that is why the likes of Sayyid Khomeini and Sayyid Sadr and other are all saying that believing in Allah and, uh, and believing in the Prophet is enough to be a Muslim. You don't even have to believe in the hereafter. They are that liberal, these ulama of ours. Yes? That liberal. I'm saying, and a person endowed with that divine light would know that when I expand my borders, for the sake of bringing about formalistic Islam, am I serving the cause of God? Is that man who is so spiritual in his own religion like a Christian, let us say, or a Jew, and Quran praises them, isn't he a spiritual person? Isn't he a moral person? Yes? If I were to make him into Muslim and he prostrates to God, now he changes the name from Jehovah to Allah or God to Allah. And after that, that spirituality is not within his chest. And there is no concern for the other. Has that served the purpose of God or has that defeated the purpose of God of Khilafah? He was far closer to the Khilafah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala previously before becoming a Muslim. Yes? So what happened was that the leadership that came after the Prophet was not an adequate leadership. It lacked that sense of spirituality, that prophetic vision. The Prophet never expanded the boundaries of Islam for the sake of expansion. He invited people through reason, through discourse, through pointing out to that spiritual lofty pedestal where man belongs. All of that went wrong. So then what happened was that Islam remained. In form, the spirit of Islam was missing. Their concern was, how do we pray and how do we fast? The concern of the Prophet was, who do you pray for? And why do you fast? The who and the why was missing. The prayer and fast remained. Their purpose was, how well do you go around the house of God? The Prophet's purpose was, when you go around the house of God, understand that that other human being is greater than the house of God because the real God lives in that heart as opposed to that building. Didn't Imam Sadiq say that honestly the best deed is to go around the house but better than that is to cut your tawaf and to serve somebody else. Didn't Imam Sadiq look at the Kaaba and he said, By Allah, your honor is great. But the honor of a believer far surpasses you, O Kaaba. You can be broken. And it was made out of wood at one time, you know that, right? It was burned down and God. You know Hajar Aswad went missing for 15 years, right? The Ismailis had stolen Hajar Aswad for 15 years and they grave it back. None of these things have more value than the spirit, spirited element. The rest of it was just form. 
So the form remained and the spirit went. That was the problem with Islam. So today when ISIS want to expand Islam and create Islamic Khilafah and they allow themselves to commit all forms of crimes against humanity, that is the Islam that has been left after the Prophet. In one way or another, ISIS is just a very extreme example, but in one way or another, this is the Islam that we have all been left with after the Prophet, unfortunately. And this shows the importance of having righteous leadership. See, Lady Zainab, she saw that this wasn't just an accidental occurrence that Imam Hussein finds himself in Karbala. Of course, before anybody was analyzing, they will say, well, he went accidentally there. He wanted to go to Kufa, he was intercepted and went to... She didn't understand it in that way. She understood a divine scheme in there, something else. She did not see this as a defensive battle of Imam Hussein against the forces of Yazid. She understood this as a stand of righteousness against falsehood. She went into that battlefield as a spiritual person, as a righteous and a just person. She went there with this knowledge that the reformation of the community is where my success lies. She went there understanding fully that the life of this world is transient. The life of hereafter is eternal. She went in there understanding that Imam Hussein, the love of her heart, cannot supersede her commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She understood these things fully. For her, it was something very different going on in her mind. Yes? It wasn't the way we understand it. And you know, I often think to myself that has Imam Hussein really been reduced to tears, really, this lamentations? Isn't there more to Hussein ibn Ali than this? Seriously, it's such a great sacrifice. Janab Zainab did so much seriously. Is that all there is to these people? Really? We need to think, yes? Think about it, my dear brothers. May Allah keep our youngsters alive for a very long time. Yeah, 30 years time, me and you are not here anymore. 30, 40 years time, this is clean. This, this, <laughs> we're gone. Yeah? Think about it. That window is open now. It's going to be shut very soon. We're going to stand in front of Allah. Yeah? And the Prophet. What will we respond? We wasted our life like this, just listening to them and beating our chest and crying. You know what? I said, beat the, your chest, but do something with it. Try and understand what was going on and try and do something about it. Yes? Isn't it seriously unimaginable that our mosques, and I mean, I'm guilty of this as well, remain empty? A spiritual community who is commanded in the Quran, Aqimus Salah, in a congregational capacity, yes? Aqimus Salah is not a command for praying Salah by individuals. You can do that voluntarily. That is for the community's spiritual identity, spiritual community identity. Why are the mosques empty? Why do we need to beg people to say, come and serve the mosque? Why don't we have enough motivation? Doesn't that just show that the people who cry as being oppressed are themselves complicit <laughs> to oppression. Doesn't that signal that? Doesn't it strike as anybody's head that I'm going to stand in front of Allah? I'm the one who never took any part in trying to bring about spiritual reform, moral refinement within my community and within myself. And now I cry for Imam Hussein, but I'm the one who is indirectly killing him. It's amazing the way we are thinking. Maybe we should open our minds a little bit more. But Lady Zainab understood things very, very differently and my time is finished, so I'll just finish now. You see, she is growing in that journey of hers, yes? Nobody has taken birth as angel on the face of this earth. Allah says, if there were angels walking on the face of this earth, we would have sent our messenger as an angel. You are humans walking here and therefore we have created all humans here. So you're all humans. You're all on a journey. Quran makes that very clear. She's on a beautiful journey of her own. A very spiritual journey. In which individually she is growing. Yes? But at the same time she understands the need 
of touching the community as well, of bringing about reform within the community. We see her as a human being who is quite weakened in the love of her brother. We see that, don't we? On the night of Ashura, as soon as Imam Hussein utters those words, she, he, he, he falls asleep momentarily. He sees this dream and abruptly awakens. And he says, oh, time, woe unto you as a friend. How many have awoken as your comrades within your lap only for you to lay them to rest before nightfall? She started slapping her face and fainted. This is how she is weakened in the love of her brother. But see her on the day of Ashura. She is not to be found when On and Muhammad's bodies are being carried back. <coughs> Abbas Kumi says because she did not want her brother to feel a sense of embarrassment by looking at her. But when Hussein ibn Ali is leaving, she falls at his feet and laments. Who is there for me after you? In whose hands do you leave me? You know what Imam Hussein says? He says, do not tear the arteries of my heart through your cries. Your tears shall know no end after I have gone. Zainab, this is the fate of the religion of our grandfather. Do you know what he, she said? And this is what I've heard from great many friends. She said, Hussein, go. Had I other Hussein, I would have sent them all. How she is coming through as that spirited person, spiritual person. We find her at the body of Hussein Salamullah Ali. Well, first words are what? Rabbana taqabbal minna hadha al-qurban. A lady who could not bear the mention of her death sees him without a head, decapitated. We are told that fingers are torn away from the hands. We are told the chest is mutilated, that it is sunk in. This is the state. Umar ibn Sa'ad. Did you see what Allah did to your brother, Zainab? Did you see the decree of God? Tears filled with, eyes filled with tears. Maraitu illa jamila. I have not seen anything but the beauty of God prevail as his decree has unfolded. Now comes a point where he is poking at the face of Hussein ibn Ali. You had a good set of teeth, O Hussein. The scene is this, that Imam Hussein's head is placed in a tray of gold at the feet of Yazid. He plays chess with his opponent, slams the goblet of alcohol. It spills into the tray. He looks, where are you today and what is your claim? You said your grandfather was better than mine. Yes, who can deny? This is the formal Islam. You said your mother was better than mine. That too I can't deny. But you said your father was better than mine and you are better than me. But God has shown you, has he not? This is when we are told by the Dhakirin that little Sakina looks at Sajjad. Seeing his head bowed in grief, she leaps into Zainab's arms. Zainab is unaware. Look at what he does to the head of my father. Here is a woman who now understands and has come of age in a court filled with dignitaries. It befits you, O Yazid, son of a slave, to poke away at the face of Abu Abdullah, exclaiming with pride, if indeed my forefathers were alive today, they would have commended me and said, you have taken revenge from the son of Ali. O you whose bone and muscle and meat has grown through milk of women who have chewed the livers of the friends of God. You find no sin in your action and you call on to your forefathers. If only you could hear them crying from the pits of hell, they would be telling you, Yazid, silence. 
So when that spiritual leadership went from this world, you get one like Yazid ascending the position of the Prophet and the formal Islam is intact and every ungodly act takes place. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala tayyibin al tahirin. Allahumma inna nasaluka bihaq al Hussein wa jaddihi wa bi wa ummihi wa khi wa tisati al ma'asumin min durriyatihi wa bani. Allahumma aghfir lana dunubana wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tawaffana ma'ala barar. Allahumma ajjil faraj imamina al muntadar wa jalla min ansarihi wa awanihi wal mustashadina bina yadayk. 